when I recently visited the island of Kolde, which belongs to a community of Cistercian monks lying on the very south tip of Wales, I found there a small pamphlet written by a monk. In this pamphlet, the monk, using music as a metaphor of life, suggests that, and I quote, music is change and modulation. Harmonies arise out of discord. We can bear the harmonies. It's the changes, the discord, and the dissonances within it that terrify us. How pleasant, we think, it would be to stay simple and unchanging in a lovely chord, endlessly sounding its harmonia, its harmonies. But such endless, such monotony belongs not to the kingdom of God, but to the realm of death. I think his description of an endless, unchanging harmony in music that conjures up, for me at least, an unpleasant sensory and non-aesthetic experience. In other words, the musical metaphor offered by this monk created inside me a sensory experience of a no change situation. Having Daphne as my chairman, you will have something to say about that, I'm sure. A changeless world, a changeless life, is, you, is unreal, unacceptable, unrealistic, and unthinkable. There would be no evolution, no development, no growth, if there were no such process as change. But all change inevitably involves and brings with it loss. Every birth involves the loss of a fetus. To become a child, a baby is lost. Your first sexual intercourse ends, once and for all, the state of virginity. All the many stages of the life cycle terminate old ways of being, but open up new ones. They also end illusions and idealizations, be they of what one has now lost and outgrown, or of the new state that one has just reached or, 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 or reached or achieved. In other words, if there were no change, no birth and no death, there would be no evolution of either the species or the family or of the individual person. There's a delightful Chinese story which makes this point very simply. A young emperor was wandering around his gardens accompanied by several members of his retinue. He delighted in all the, flower, all the beauty that met his eyes, the trees, the shrubs, the flowers, the buds, the birds, the timid deer, the colorful fishes in the pond. But suddenly, a shadow of sadness passed over his face. Gladness, gladness left him. He sighed. To think that one day I shall die, and then I will lose all this, he murmured. One of his courtiers overheard this, and he approached the emperor gently and whispered, Sire, if there were no death, this palace and these gardens would not be yours. Your ancestors will still be here. But first of all, I want to explore the definition of the concept of change, because it carries, I think, some ambiguities. The Oxford Dictionary defines change as a making <coughs> or becoming different. Now, Joe Redfern, in a lecture entitled Can Be Change, said, one kind of change in which mankind is very interested is to do with feelings of creation, transformation, redemption, and redemption. And God said, let there be light. This is the beginning of change, the beginning of consciousness, of knowledge, of 
I am I. Redfern refers here to really radical and overpowering events. And this has led me to question, to questions like, what do we mean by change? And how does change relate to other, the neighboring concepts like growth, development, transition, transformation, etc.? It seems to me that change has a more dramatic, a more drastic connotation than either growth or development. For instance, the fetus grows and develops by regular and natural increments until, that is, until the moment of birth, which I think is a dramatic change. May be useful to look at change as contrasted with growth and development in terms of the laws of dialectics. Growth and development involve what you might say, quantitative changes, quantitative movements. But change represents and constitutes a sort of qualitative leap. To give a clinical example, a man whose mother had died in childbirth when he was four years old had come into analysis because he had become impotent. We'd worked hard together for many months, for almost a year. He was a colorless, quiet, and above all, a joyless and emotionally flat person who worked with, or rather under, his father in a building business. But one day he arrived, looking considerably more alive. He then told me, with a new and unfamiliar animation, that he had all of a sudden <clears throat> felt himself come out of a fog in which he now recognized he'd lived unbeknown to himself ever since he could remember. Now this was indeed what I would call a true change, a new psychological birth. His moods, his behavior, and his experience of himself and of the persons and objects in the world around him were transformed from that day onwards. He gradually became more potent again, and then also began to set up a business of his own and on his own. Ephra Redfern, in this passage I have just quoted, also links the idea of change to such dramatic events and experiences like creation and transformation. The experience of loss and of separation, which form part of the process of change, is associated with death and with dying. They're all the inevitable concomitants of birth and of change. Indeed, the existence of death is the very precondition of evolution and of the development of unconsciousness and of psychic growth. The link between birth and death, between loss and gain, is known with more or less consciousness by most people. This is clearly shown in the various origin of death stories and myths and legends, particularly in Africa. There is, for instance, a story told by people in Central Africa who describe how God one day called men and women together and said to them, you can choose either to procreate and to die or to live forever. The men wanted to elect to live forever, but the women were the first to express their desire. We want to die. We want to bring children into the world. And they are the Nupi of East Africa. They tell that God had created tortoises and men, and gave life to them. But not, he didn't give life to the stones. And then God added that if the living have two or three children, then they must die. Then both the tortoise and the men demand the children, and then death. But the stones did not want children, nor to die. And so it was decreed. Many 
many of the origin of death stories tell of the threat of overpopulation. Come, some think of death as a release from illness and old age, or as an escape from weariness and the troubles of life. And some express quite directly men's need and wish to renew themselves. We would rather die like banana trees who leave descendants than like the moon to rise again. You notice that's the idea that suddenly flashed into my mind. Much of this has to do with a problem that's so powerful these days by the population explosion. And they seem to have thought of these problems when they invented the idea when they accepted the idea of death. Given that the experience of loss and separation accompany both birth and death, it is not surprising that there is much similarity in the birth and the death rituals in different parts of the world and in many different cultures. For instance, in many places, the dead person is buried in the fetal position, or the rituals either for receiving the new baby or the new corpse, may involve bathing, the unction with oil, and or the giving of a special, a new name. Amongst many people, the equivalent of birth and death rests on the assumption that the other world is in fact a mirror image of this world. And that so, and that so say the Ashanti of Ghana, every time an earth mother smiles at the birth of a child, a spirit mother mourns the loss of a child. No, I think, is the notion that what one would gain, uh, what one world gains, the other world loses, is that I don't think it's all that strange, even to us here. There is, for instance, a saying that whom the gods love die young. And Jung reports the conversation of the three-year-old little girl called Anna with her grandmother. Anna says, Granny, why are your eyes so dim? Oh, because I'm old, she answered. But will you become young again? Oh, no. I shall become older and older, and then I will die. And then will you become a baby again? I think there's a lot of thought idea that we have been angels until we were born into this world, then hopefully we go back to the same state. Jung explained this conversation by explaining that people tended to believe that babies had been little angels who lived in heaven and then were brought down to earth by the stork. Indeed, he himself linked closely together both birth and death as having been part of the life process, an integral part of it. He also stated that in his opinion, the highest summit of life can be expressed through the symbolism of death, and that any growing beyond oneself also means death. However, he was not always consistent. That's not one of his great qualities. For when he tried to relate the birth death is symbolism to clinical experience, he suggested that on the whole, the emergence of the symbolism of birth in a patient tends to act as a pointer towards the future, while the symbolism of death represents on the whole a backward look, a look towards the past. And there's another passage in Symbols of Transformation which I found quite particularly interesting, because it points to a remarkable affinity between Jung and Klein. I think it is worthwhile for me to quote it in full, although it is a bit lengthy. This is what Jung writes. In the morning of life, the son tears himself loose from the mother, from the domestic half, to rise through battle to his destined heights. Always he imagines his worst enemy in front of him. Yet he carries the, en the, en the enemy he carries the enemy within himself, a deadly longing for the abyss, a longing to drown in his own source, 
to be sucked down to the realm of the mothers. His life is a constant struggle against extinction, a violent yet fleeting deliverance from ever-lurking night. This death is no external enemy. It is his own inner longing for the stillness and profound peace of all-knowing non-existence, for all-seeing sleep in the ocean of coming to be and passing away. And if a man is to live, he must sacrifice longing for the past in order to rise to his own heights. And having reached the noonday heights, he must sacrifice his love for his own achievement. He must sacrifice his love for his own achievements. But although there is here a significant overlap between Jung and Klein, in other words, both say the death which is inside us, when they think about death, when, between Jung and Klein, when they think about death and Thanatos, that is the wish for death as being innate, elemental, primary and archetypal, Jung added a further dimension. When he recognized and explored the ubiquity, the ubiquity of the motive of rebirth, its pervasiveness and appearance at all times and in all cultures, made him feel justified in proposing that rebirth is indeed a basic, powerful, and therefore an archetypal theme or complex. It is perhaps this concept of the rebirth theme and the way it functions in and through the various psychological processes that gives a particular quality and particular flavor to Jung's theories and to the clinical and therapeutic work of analytical psychologists. For the rebirth theme extends and seems to go beyond Klein's concept of reparation. <coughs> While reparation involves only the remaking or reconstituting of what has been, the theme of rebirth implies that something new, something unexpected, and as yet unknowable, may actually emerge if, but only if, discomfort, disorientation, despair, or even chaos can be tolerated. This difference between reparation and rebirth is particularly important in our understanding of the creative process. The concept of reparation depends on the thesis that the creative process is set in motion in order to mend what has been damaged or even destroyed. Rebirth, on the other hand, encourages the hope that something novel may be born. And it encourages the willingness to be surprised and thus surrender all illusion of omniscience. The rebirth theme furthermore supports a positive attitude and a positive expectation that change, in spite of its inevitable association with loss, will or may also bear some good fruit, some growth and some advancement, and so embolden people to expose themselves to change. But is it really not surprising that because of the inevitable interaction and interdependence of life and death, growth and decay, loss and gain, um, loss and gain ambivalence to change should figure so importantly in all analysis. Indeed, the longing for change, the fear of change, and resistance of change is one of the most central themes in every analysis. When patients first decide to come into analysis, many of them hope and consciously wish for change. It often seems as if they want to strip off their actual personal identity, like one may strip off some suit or dress. They seem to imagine that at the end of analysis, they will walk out with a brand new outfit. In other words, curiously, they want, uh, consciously, sorry, consciously, they want a really big change. But 
Once the process of analysis has begun, they struggle and fight and resist any modification, any disturbance of the habitual ways of being or feeling or, recre or reacting or behaving. They seem to cling to the status quo. This fear of all change and the disbelief in change is also, I think, at the root of the predominant theme of separation. In that there is often a constant preoccupation and a constant pain about separation. And then the frequent experienced difficulty to join up again, to separate and to rejoin again and again, every session, every week, every term, every holiday, again and again and again. This upheaval can indeed last over many months or even over many years. A patient came, became preoccupied as soon as she had started analysis with a fear of how terrible it will feel when analysis comes to an end. She simply at that time could not imagine that she herself might one day be different, feel different, that one day her own growth would make her ready and willing to allow analysis to come to an end. This inability to conceive of a change in herself left her at first haunted by panic and preoccupied by the ultimate fate of all analysis, i.e. the end. I'm also thinking here of the case of an adolescent girl who had, be, who had regressed to the level of an 18-month-old infant. Now, in her first interview with me, the mother, the social worker of this daughter, felt there was something to do with the mother and asked for the mother to go into analysis. When the mother arrived in her first interview, she told me, that she would rather have her daughter suffer from some physical illness which would keep her at home and in bed than have her go off to school every morning. So here was a startling example of a mother refusing to accept se separation from her daughter and allow her to develop a sense of being separate. But this mother's resistance to separate must, I think, have fed and fueled the daughter's temptation to allow, to also resist all separation from her mother. Otherwise, such severe regression could not have happened. And I think a lot of truancy has something often to do with mothers encouraging children not to go to school, but to hold them at home, bind them to their home. The fear of change is thus the fear of potential loss. I believe one of the major roots and reasons for what we, is, we have called the negative therapeutic reaction is, has something to do with that. This is the name given to that clinical phenomenon when a patient's symptoms seem to return and even become aggravated and actually worse, just as things seem to be moving forward. This seems to happen just when there has in fact been actual improvement. A number of unconscious motives have been suggested to account for this phenomenon, such as the need to prove the analyst to be basically ineffectual and impotent, and so escape the discomfort and the shame of envy. Or else there might be guilt that one has achieved some health, some feeling better, at the expense, perhaps, of someone else. Or there could be a masochistic need <coughs> that that is a need to find excitement, pleasure and satisfaction in and through suffering and pain, which one cannot or will not surrender in favor of health and more comfort. But Freud, in Analysis Terminable and Interminable, has suggested that a negative therapeutic reaction is, in fact, the expression and the result of thanatos, the death drive, conceived as opposed to eros, the life drive. Thanatos, Freud believed, drives a living organism back towards an earlier, an inorganic state, 
and is the biological expression or equivalent of entropy. Now, Jung did not accept the concept of a separate, distinct death drive. He clarified his own position <clears throat> in his pay, uh, book called Two Essays in Analytical Psychology, where he wrote, what Freud probably means is that is the essential fact that every process is a phenomenon of energy and all energy can only proceed from the tension of opposites. It is sufficiently obvious that life, like any other process, has a beginning and an end. And every beginning <coughs> is also the beginning of the end. I think we can see in the negative therapeutic reaction the resistance to change, a clinging to what has been, is familiar. It is a sort of the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. It is really a turning backwards, a shying away from the new for one reason or another. In the light of Jung's remarks, we can see it as a turning away from life, and life includes and involves change. And life and change inev inevitably have many beginnings and many ends and make for a constant round of births and deaths. The negative therapeutic reaction is perhaps also akin to another phenomenon, clearly de described by Pierre Hultberg in 1985, in the, uh, published in the Journal of Analytical Psychology, where he describes the fear of success. And this time it's Hultberg, describes the fear of success. I myself discovered some of the dynamics of the fear of success when I was working with students in a therapeutic group situation. Two of the students suffer from quite severe and disabling what I call examinitis. That is the crippling anxiety, even panic, about examinations. The anxiety was so overpowering that it could not sit the examination at all. Now, in the course of our work together, a fantasy emerged. The student, in fantasy, finds himself or herself in a dark tunnel, which is unpleasant enough. But if he or she gets through the tunnel and reaches the other side, he or she finds himself or herself in a strange place in which he or she cannot recognize anything. And what is worse, he cannot recognize him or herself. He or she feels a stranger to himself or herself. These fantasies reminded me of the often very frightening and very painful adolescent initiation rites to which individuals must, must go if they are to move from one status in their society to another, a new one. Because once you've gone through initiation, to the, any particular initiation, there is no going back once the ceremony has been completed. And the symbolism of birth is often quite obvious and enacted in these ceremonies. Now the process of actual biological birth, of giving birth, of being born, has in fact much in common with the process of creating, be this in the arts, the sciences, in personal or social relationships, or in shaping and directing one's own life. To remind you quickly of the four stages of the creative process, as these have been discovered by artists, scientists, philosophers, and psychologists. The first stage is the stage of preparation, when one assembles together one's interests, ideals, ideas, skills, and knowledge. The second stage is the stage of incubation. This is or can be the most difficult or even the most painful stage. One's interests, one's concern, and one's ideas seem to have gone underground. One feels baffled, out of touch with what seemed to have preoccupied one, and, seems little, and there seems little hope that we will find an answer, a solution, a way forward. One is, as it were, driven into passivity. But then, if one is lucky, a third stage bursts in on one, the inspiration. 
Many describe this experience of it, the inspiration, as having been sent, having been revealed, or being a gift. A gift, be it from the gods, from the muses, or from one's own unconscious. It feels as if one had received the gift of grace. Many describe how they just had to sit passively by and the inspiration part came and they didn't feel they had made it, it happened to them. But the fourth stage, the stage of critical testing, brings one back to earth. Now man must test, examine and evaluate what inspiration had produced. Consciousness is once more required. The creative process involves a collaboration, that, therefore, of opposing functions and attitudes. Consequently, a person who wants to create or to be creative must be able to tolerate and to be available to freely moving oscillations between periods of control and periods, periods of surrender, periods of active doing and periods of passive acceptance and receptivity. Both birth and creating face a person with the new, the unfamiliar, and both involve the sacrifice of the perfect, of the idealized. I'm thinking here of a young woman who was a very, very avant-garde. She had been very involved with Greenpeace. She shared with many others a general trust in and reverence for nature and all that is natural. But the birth of her first child had been extremely difficult. She was in labor for almost three days. And then she had, in fact, to have a caesarean. Recently, a few months later, she expressed anger at what she now feels as a general collusion with her own previous idealizations. That is a somewhat blind expectation that the natural is always the best. She felt that she has been, had been strung along, had been betrayed and made a fool of, and that her prenatal teetering, designed to prepare for natural childbirth, had failed to warn her that things can go wrong. In that context, I also think of Marion Milner, who has drawn attention to the disappointment the creative artist might feel when he looks at what he has made and then recognize that the finished product is often not as good or as exciting than it had been the process of making it. Of course, all making of art involves the translation, or you might say the clothing, of an experience which is actually immaterial or non-material into something material. We seem to need to make or to find form in order to be able to experience the abstract, to hold it, contain it, and communicate it to others as well as to ourselves. We poets, so writes a Chinese poet, struggle with non-being to force it to yield being. And Archibald MacLeish, in his book Poetry and Experience, writes in 1961, the poet's labor is to struggle with the meaningless and silence of the world until he can force it to mean, until he can make the silence answer and non-being be. It is indeed rare for an artist to find that what he had created, what he attempted to infuse into form, is really as complete, as satisfactory, as satisfying and as true as had been his feelings and ideas. Thus, both birth and creation bring also the experience of loss and with it the task to work with and make do with the less perfect, to, to nurture it, the less perfect and to make it the best of it, to make the best of it. All this depends on one's capacity to come to terms with one's resentments and disappointments. This may be helped along if one can remember 
not only the fears and the losses that are part of change, but also the adventure, the exploration, the excitement and the joy of having achieved, having made or received the new. Be the new person, a new object, a new preoccupation, a new interest, activity, challenge, or a new goal. I suspect that those who resist change are people who, as a result of their history and personality, undervalue or even ignore the potentially positive features, possibilities, and, uh, and effects of the new brought about by change. They seem to be able to see only the dark side of change. They cannot see its light side, the joys and satisfactions that have resulted from change. It is also likely that such persons cannot trust themselves and seem to lack confidence in their own resources. Because, of course, when you find yourself in a new world, in a new situation, you have to draw on new resources, new abilities inside you in order to handle it and benefit by it. They may fear that the new will demand new abilities, and they may thus find themselves to be, to, to be, to be out of control and less effectual. They may also suspect that they will find it difficult to experience at the same time sadness and regret at their losses, as well as joy and excitement at what they have gained. Of course, it matters on what one has lost. Is it a particular stage in life? Or is it one's health? Or the new use of part of one's own body, or a skill, or a mental faculty? Or is it one's home, or one's job? or a pet, or a partner, or is it the love, loss of a loved person? For this loss is probably the last one, the loved person, or the partner, is probably the most painful, the most devastating, the most confusing, and the most disorientating, to the point that one may become a stranger to oneself. Yes, Another woman, a patient who had lost her mother when she was five, five years old, recently she heard that a college friend of hers had been killed in a plane crash. Soon after getting this news, she dreamt that she came to a house. Through the door she saw a man sitting at a table with his head back to her. Several people were, were there with her. But then she sees she hears a police car siren. It seems to rush along towards them, and there's a loud noise like gunfire. A woman tries to get into the house. Another woman holds on to her and tries to stop her from going in. The dreamer thinks that something awful has happened, a murder, a crime. In the confusion, he turns to the woman nearest to her and asks, Mummy, what has happened? But the woman is calm and explains that only a table has been overturned. So there's nothing to worry about. Nothing sensational has happened. This dream carries a great number of fantasies and meanings. But one of its features reminds me of my own reflections when I compare the African myths of the order of death and the African ten person's tendency. Um, lost myself to explain the death of an actual person as due, which they think of as due to some aggressive, hostile or destructive act by one person against the other. There is then an, here an implicit denial that death is a natural phenomenon. But this attitude is not really confined to Africans, for there seems to be, whenever there is a death, a general search for someone's fault, negligence or neglect or malevolence, and there's a hard, there's nearly universal reaction, even in our own so-called rational and scientific society, that death isn't natural. Somebody's done it. I wonder whether the proof mourning, the loss of a loved person, having been by now much observed and studied, and being a particularly intense experience, is perhaps a model, a paradigm, that reveals and traces out the pattern and the sequence 
of reactions when one comes face to face with change, even the minor changes and losses of daily life. To end this paper, I return to the monk with whose quotations I started the, this talk, for he seems to summarize what I have tried to argue here. Talking of Christ, he writes, his coming will not be without pain, but we will know it as the pain not of death, but of birth, or of both, for we must always die in order to be born anew. Now, the central idea in this paper is, is that out of loss can come the creative impulse. Moreover, attending to the vicissitudes of the affective responses to loss may help us to pick up what has more creative potential from the more destructive sequelae of loss. Loss, in real and metaphorical ways, as we know, provokes anger, guilt and sadness. The grief of loss is a complex state of mind with different lengths of duration and in each individual shows different mixes of other constituent affects such as anger, guilt, shame, envy and jealousy as well as the frequently accompanying depression with varying degrees of somatic disruptions. Each person has various thresholds of defences against depression, of which the manic defence is the most characteristic. And as you'll see, I'm going to talk a bit about that. Soon. Since loss plays so great a part in creativity, it's important first to consider depressive response to loss and its characteristic defence by examining some psychoanalytic ideas which provide a framework for thinking about creativity. I shall then go on to consider one of the most comprehensive descriptions of the common factors in creativity across a wide spectrum, as shown in Rothenberg's book, The Emerging Goddess. I shall then consider the group as a crucible in which grief, loss, and creativity can be expressed in different ways. And lastly, I shall examine the writer who is perhaps the most striking exemplar of all these experiences in general, Shakespeare, whose middle period play, All's Well That Ends Well, binds together grief, loss and creativity, both in its own content and in the circumstances surrounding its composition and context. And it also happens to be in a very fine production of it at the Royal Shakespeare Company at the, at the pit at just this autumn. Now, research work, particularly at the Tavistock, by um, Manuel Lewis and Sandy Bourne, has shown how difficult it is approaching or around the time of birth for normal mourning processes to take place. The denial and confusion involved in accepting minus one at the time of creating plus one, a situation shared by others in the powerful emotional field surrounding the mother at birth, has been further highlighted by the same researcher's important work on stillbirths, demonstrating the hidden resistances which appear to take place both on mourning and in its subsequent remembering and recording in history. The reason for this is that it might be easier to accept a continuation of naught rather than explore the status, the painful status of the minus one, particularly since it's so easy for there to be so little conscious noting of the potential plus one since the baby that represented the potential for new life was out of sight in the womb. Now, this research work illustrates how difficult it is to sort out the difficulties surrounding situations where births and deaths are found in close proximity. There may be something of the same difficulty for those who are having to take on board the loss of a missing person, because the ambiguity of loss makes it difficult for the subject to know where he is 
in relation to the emotional task in hand. This can be seen dramatically in Arthur Miller's first theatrical creative hit, All My Sons, which was built out of the experience surrounding a missing person from the Second World War. The denial of the depressive reality that afflicted the mother of the missing son in All My Sons meant that she had to accept her husband's death as well as that of her dead son. Minus two rather than just minus one. It's important when considering such losses to remind ourselves of modern ways of handling grief which recognize the importance of seeing the dead person or baby. The actuality of death needs to be marked with the senses so that any ambiguity concerning its presence can be squashed. The creative artist, though, uses this area of ambiguity. A death may be represented straight as in a, tra as in a tragedy, but even if it happened in real life, the death can be used in a comic situation I mean, in comedy technically, as a genre. So the denial mechanism is used in a manic way to imagine what might have been. In such a way, the creative artist can use the area of ambiguity surrounding death to deny the loss of the loved one. This perhaps most obviously underpinned Shakespeare's creation of the romance group of plays at the end of his life. Peter Hildebrand has written a very interesting paper demonstrating the similarity of the dynamic structures of Hamlet and the Tempest, where in the Tempest everybody is preserved for its happy ending, a denouement which contrasts vividly with the carnage at the end of Hamlet. However, Shakespeare's immense outpouring of creativity following loss found expression much earlier in his career in his creative use of the manic fantasy. Shakespeare is particularly interested to explore in his work the different ways in which two can become one and one can become two. Sometimes he uses his characters as mirrors of each other. At other times he divides a key part into two or more responses so that oneself becomes two characters. In this way, one can play two and two can play one. The simplest exemplification of this can be seen as the use of a pun when the meaning is true in two different ways at the same time. You will remember, maybe, that Freud first quoted his friend Jekylls in a paper that nobody's ever discovered, a crucial minus one, it seems, who allegedly suggested that one should see Macbeth and Lady Macbeth as two aspects of one character. Shakespeare was, through his plays, making syntheses of the mirroring of his own and his plays outside reality in which births and losses take place, plus ones and minus ones. Shakespeare therefore extends his own capacity to divide or double at will. An individual can also carry history with him or her so that in some respects he or she becomes two. This is particularly germane when considering the subsequent lives of children born in the shadow of another's death. Such children carry both positives and negatives from their situation as they grow up. A study of people's first names is often revealing, and I've felt in my own history taking that a powerful idealization or a black sheep projective identification from the previous generation may affect the whole course of a person's life, especially when such people reach the age that their parents were when they or their next sibling <coughs> was born. It may be important for us as psychotherapists to pick up the lineaments of two disparate sides of themselves that our patients may be showing. The split may represent in projecting warring pa uh, parents. If abuse or trauma intervenes, an early introject of an important figure may exist in the form of a circumscribed island which may suddenly erupt. Multiple personality phenomena are often underpinned by severe degrees of this experience. There are times, however, when family members may kindle afresh the past family figure 
which the individual is carrying within him or herself. Now this phenomena of the individual's carrying of a past history was clarified for me by Avril Earnshaw, an Australian psychotherapist who introduced me to ideas about critical dates. She found that mothers, for instance, she often gave birth to an autistic child at the age when their own mother had had a stillbirth. We also know that children of a special promise had been born following the death of previous siblings. Shakespeare himself was one of these, and it's interesting that both Beethoven and Van Gogh were born a year to the day after a previous sibling's death. Now, I want to draw your attention, too, to the importance of the manic-depressive bipolarity in studying the creative impulse. Kay Jamison, uh, an American worker who did a... Um, a sabbatical and the study on this at St. George's while I was there, she made a study of a group of very creative artists show, showing that there was a high percentage of manic depressives. And, the, and this was particularly true um, amongst poets, Robert Lowell perhaps being a good example. We may also consider the implications for exploring the nature of creativity by examining the particular split in the underlying characterological structure of creative patients. In my opinion, such people are characterized by a split in time which becomes extremely disconnected between, on the one hand, despair, which represents a travesty of common depressive reality, and on the other hand, denial, the manic state, which sees the future suffused with false hope and which loses touch with the hard ground of depressive reality. Each person has his own bedrock of depressive reality, which his consciousness is trying to escape. This desire to escape is extraordinarily infectious to those around, so that it becomes even more important to anchor any outburst of manic excitement to its appropriate depressive core. Now, each unintegrated swing of the pendulum in time makes for a vicious circle effect, where a tradition becomes laid down like this. Depressive failure, which cannot be stayed with, is followed by the even greater need to turn again to the manic defence. And the capacity for self-destruction amongst manic depressives in such people is high, shown not just by the high suicide rate, but also by their personal relationships and the fate of their own creative endeavours. They need help in sorting out what is of value in their own depressive loss and in appreciating true hope and the reparative capacity which can be extracted from their manic swing. It is my belief that aspects of the bipolar dynamic exist subclinically in many ne never diagnosed uh, manic depressive characters. And it was said of Shakespeare's most manic depressive character, Timon of Athens, that, that the middle of humanity thou never knewest, but the extremity of both ends. So therefore, we have two clinical tasks to keep in mind in the management of the manic in this regard. One is that we must keep consistently held for them the anchor of their specific depressive reality, however unpleasant. And the other is that we must value and sometimes save from destructive punishment the core of their creativity. Now, in my training at the Maudsley Hospital, Henri Ray emphasised the importance of remembering the gender stereotypes represented in the manic depressive. Firstly, the male whose man it penis is shooting off in different directions, but always away from the woman. And secondly, the woman who in her depression is either left empty with herself on her own or left holding the baby, screaming and entirely without the man's help. Bringing these two halves together in mutually supportive, complementary and creative intercourse needs to occur both interpsychically, where sexual intercourse may represent one plus one equaling three, and also intra-psychically, a half plus a half equaling one whole or entire, thus creating 
middle, thus creating bridging middle ground by bringing the two halves of the psyche together. Now in our therapeutic stance, we may, must watch out for the manic impulse which may manifest itself in several different ways, either in anticipation of death or in a glorification of dying or in the act of dying or in a manic grandiosity afforded to those who have died. It's also possible to see how partisan patriotism may take over this experience of death, particularly when we're considering the political sphere. Both in our study of politics and in our work with psychotic patients, we need also to see where manic denial mechanisms start up in tandem with projective mechanisms in an inflationary paranoid grandiosity. So that the creative artist may not always remember the depression that lies behind the creative response. If he does not, he can be in danger of a takeover by somebody who wants to use creative work to build an empire for his own purposes. Such empires can be both in the real world and in the world of entertainment. Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Hitler and Milosevic have all had their particular manic dream of political empire. We've also seen the interesting phenomena of the states in our generation building up an empire of entertainment and film in Hollywood, which not only represented the fantasy of the American dream, but through the glorification of its B-movie star, provided a model of rational government which has only recently crumbled. <laughs> uh, I found the most gripping and relevant book on the creative process to be with that phoenix-like title, The Emerging Goddess. It was written by a psychologist, Albert Rothenberg, who as a research professor at, Ray at Yale with an NIMH grant, interviewed in dynamic depth a great number and range of creative people in the arts, sciences and other fields over a period of 15 years. In giving exciting examples from these different fields, he details what he believes to be the common factors which make for intense creativity. He finds that it's necessary for some characteristics of the dream or of dream processes to be present in the consciously controlled thoughts of the creative artist and he singles out two specific characteristics of such thought. The first characteristic is an atemporal use of opposites which he calls Janusian thinking after the Roman god who looked in several different directions at the same time. The idea is to bridge a paradox, as it were, by superimposing two or more opposite or antithetical ideas, images or concepts simultaneously. It involves giving equal weight to both components, often across different times and from different parts of the mind. It involves primary process thinking and the use of what Matty Blanco calls symmetrical logic. Matty Blanco's valuable description of biologic may also help us to understand the workings of creativity, although Rothenberg appears not to be familiar with Matty Blanco's work. The mirror images that Rothenberg thus fits together are accompanied by or merge with pre-conscious and unconscious affects, wishes and defence mechanisms. The second process called homospatial thinking consists of superimposing two or more discrete entities occupying the same space, a conception which allows new identities to be articulated. Although most often visual, the process may involve any of the other sensory modalities. It involves the superimposition of whole entities rather than the consideration of parts side by side. It is a type of spatial abstraction taken from nature an integration of the Janusian processes. One of its chief functions is to produce creative metaphors. It can bring concepts and percepts together in words and or images. It can bring together, for instance, subject and object or different affective responses, sex and aggression, reality and myth, or past image and present image. All of these possibilities, drawn from our knowledge of the mind as exemplified in dreams, can be performed in directed consciousness 
by the creative person. These two processes then can be harnessed by the creator, the one Janusian thinking allowing one to become two, and the other homospatial thinking for two to become one. There are two obvious reasons for singling out a dramatist and a play to exemplify this paper's theme. The first has to do with the characteristic of the event of theatre-going. Whereas many creative activities are essentially solitary, merely drawing on corporate experience, the theatre is a medium where there is, by its very nature, a corporate involvement in the artistic process. The audience is aware not only of the actors, but also the other audience members, and these together create a moment and a series of moments in which spoken and unspoken communications combine to have a complex effect, both individual and corporate. A play has a series of triangles built into the nature of the event, and it therefore shares many of the similar creative potentialities that a group experience has at its disposal, and which may not be available or may be available in a different way in one-to-one -one experiences. In introducing Shakespeare, I'm becoming more and more conscious of how extraordinary his experience was to be the leader of a group of players over a period of at least 18 years with only minimal and gradual changes of personnel. It has not been sufficiently clearly pointed out that the central core of Shakespeare's players shared bereavements in common in losing their original leaders. The Earl of Leicester's play troupe, Leicester's men, were taken over on his death in 1588 by Ferdinando Lord Strange. He in turn became Earl of Derby in 1593 but died the following year in 1594. Then the troop reformed first of all under the name of the Countess of Derby's players and then quickly thereafter became the Lord Chamberlain's players, although that, that they, uh, that there were two Lord Chamberlains with the same men and one died and then the other replaced him. Uh, it, so that, that happened all in, in the late 1590s. But the Earl of Derby's death in 1594, however, was by no means isolated. During the period from 1592 to 1594, four of the Elizabethan poet dramatists, Green, Watson, Marlowe and Kidd, all died, in addition to the player's leader and patron, Lord Strange. It would be hard to imagine a more creative group in turning their joint personal experience of loss into the performances of a string of masterpieces which mark the high point of British drama in the Elizabethan, or indeed any period. But the play by Shakespeare, which I want to consider in some detail in relationship to this theme of grief, loss and creativity, is one of those rather infrequently played, all's well that ends well. It picks up themes, particularly from earlier plays, about eight to ten years before it. But its approximate date of composition of 1601 or two would link it to Shakespeare's father's own death in 1601 and also to the recent bereavement of his patroness, the Countess of Pembroke, and her son, William, who lived in the southwest of England. In this way, it catches the doubly bereaved Williams, Shakespeare himself and William Herbert, who have both lost their fathers. One of the remarkable features of the play is the way it moves rapidly across Europe. The main scenes are set in the capital Paris in the court, or and in the court, court of the Countess of Roussillon in the southwest of France, and in Florence, where the hero Bertram goes to fight. These locations may be seen to echo the capital London, the seat of the Countess of Pembroke at Wilton House in the southwest, and a foreign country further southeast. On top of these, we can see the superimposition of further geographical parallels. The popular French king, Henri IV, had been in deep mourning when his favorite mistress had died in childbirth, and this led him in 1600 to look to Florence to marry the daughter of the Grand Duke of Tuscany as the way to remedy the hole in the Bourbon succession. 
The opening lines of All's Well That Ends Well are concerned with loss. Would you like to do a little bit with me? Bertram is talking with his mother, the Countess of Roussillon, about his desire to go back to the French court. The opening lines of the play, however low-key, set the theme, the Countess. In delivering my son from me, I bury a second husband. Bertram. And I, in going, madam, weep o'er my father's death anew. Almost immediately, we learn of two important things, a cause for grief and another bereavement. The cause for grief is that the King of France is deathly ill with a fistula, which in medical parlance is a pathological opening, rather like a junction box when two systems become breached into one, with the result that two becomes one, as it were, and then one becomes two, only those two may be the other way around. The Countess suggests that help for the French king may lie in the hands of a young woman, Helena, who is staying at her palace and who has also suffered the recent bereavement of her father, Gérard de Narbonne, known as such a famous healer that he was skilful enough to have lived still if knowledge could be set up against mortality. It's not long before Helena is at the French court, but she has a difficult task to persuade the depressed king that he will risk being healed. Indeed, his pessimism comes to the fore when asked directly, will you be cured of your infirmity? And he replies succinctly, no. When he is eventually persuaded to try Helena's healing powers, which come, as she says, directly from her dead father, his reluctance to allow her even to try is expressed in a powerful statement of his ambivalence. Thou this to hazard needs must intimate skill infinite or monstrous desperate. Sweet practiser, thy physic I will try that ministers thine own death if I die. <laughs> Helena, therefore, is put in a position of having to risk all if she is to heal the king, and she extracts from him a promise that if she is able to heal him, she may choose any husband she likes from among the young courtiers. Despite the king's pessimism and reluctance to believe in her success, she's indeed successful and chooses Bertram. Bertram is horrified. <laughs> And despite apparently agreeing, he didn't have much choice with the king there, he immediately enlists his friend Parolles in working out a plan to take their sword and drum to the wars in Florence, packing off Helena back to his mother in Roussillon. Although taking immediate flight from France, Bertram did leave Helena a letter, the terms of which set down some of the actions in the subsequent plot of the play. When thou canst get the ring upon my finger, which never shall come off, and show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. But in such a then, I write a never. And then, till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Now, she determines to go off on a pilgrimage to St. Jack's, St. James. But instead of going west to Santiago de Compostela, following the well-known pilgrimage route of the time, she goes east to Florence, where she gets wind of her betrothed's fame as a soldier, together with news of his sexual interest in a local girl, Diana. Now, there are two further important elements in the plot. The first is that at the time when Bertram is expressing sexual interest in Diana, Parolles loses his drum and creates mayhem among the soldiers, eventually being tricked by his colleagues into thinking that he has been captured. Blindfolded and under pain of torture and death, he's manipulated into betraying his colleagues, notably Bertram. The second important element of the plot is that Helena has organised and carried out a bed trick. 
So that instead of sleep, instead of Bertram sleeping with the chaste goddess Diana, Bertram sleeps with her, the pilgrim Helena. Instead of dying in a convent, as described to Bertram and later the king, Helena both captures the ring and becomes pregnant. And the last act sees all the characters back in the French court. The king sees the ring. Bertram invents a series of lies, but all comes out into the open, and Bertram begs forgiveness, promising to Helena, if she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I'll love her dearly, ever, ever dearly. In the Romance tradition, therefore, we are left, despite the psychological unlikelihood of such a miraculous transformation, thinking that he has learned and will continue to learn from his and Prolis' experiences to pin his future hopes in her. Now, this play is the most striking exemplification of the creative working through of grief, but it also best exemplifies Rothenberg's thesis concerning the dynamics of creativity, a point which Ted Hughes, the poet laureate, makes in explaining why this is such a key play in initiating the great works, the greatest works of Shakespeare's maturity. Ted Hughes, moreover, draws our attention to the remarkable intertwining of Bertram and Parolis in plot and subplot and sees them both as self-referential confessions of Shakespeare's own guilt. In working from within Shakespeare's creativity, we can see in the numerical notation that I'm suggesting that Janusian thinking allows one to become two and homospatial thinking for two to become one. These two processes are happening all the time and the knife edge of creativity, therefore, has to do with the ins and outs of these two processes, one becoming two and two becoming one. They create their own intercourse with its potential creative outcome in a place centering on death, sexual intercourse and birth and new generation, allowing the phoenix to be created anew. Freud's concentration on actual sexuality and Jung's researches into the roots of hermaphroditism in such alchemical texts as the Rosarium of 1570 can perhaps find a recreative synthesis in which both elements contribute helpful explanatory hypotheses. It's interesting that in Norman Holland's psychoanalytic view of Shakespeare, the most comprehensive psychoanalytic study of all's well that ends well at the time of, write, of his writing was an essay by Barbara Hanna, a close associate of Jung. The phoenix arises from the alchemical fire, which is part of the creative container in which La Feu, the steward, of the Countess of Roussillon, interesting you, you see with that name, plays his part in getting Parolis and Bertram into the alchemical fire together. Through their manic mechanisms, which have to do with their manic part, getting caught up in identification with each other, two becomes one. In the fallout of the alchemical fire, a different pairing emerges that of Bertram and Helena. If Parolis and Bertram begin in separation, go through humiliation together, and finally reach a creative separation, we can equally well look at the symmetry between Bertram and Helena. These two characters, as we learn, have both just lost their fathers and are representative of two aspects or modes of reaction to mourning the depressive internalization and the manic flight. Helena has taken to herself her father's most potent remedy and she sees herself as equipped in double strength, armed with a combination of masculine drive and potency with a most receptive sensitivity of her feminine feeling side. Just as we said earlier that it's very difficult to stay with the depressive anchor of the manic defense, so we do not easily see the anticipation pattern that is denied in mania. Bertram realised that he was trapped by his betrothal, surely because through sex he would be identifying as a new married count with his father who's just died. The French king, when first greeting Bertram, makes the link clearer. Youth, thou bearest thy father's face. 
Frank nature, rather curious than in haste, hath well composed thee. Thy father's moral parts mayst thou inherit too. Helena, therefore, has identified with her father by internalizing him so that she can be creative. Bertrand, on the other hand, has identified with his father in such a way that he cannot cope with the situation of becoming an actual husband. He may have been able to tolerate the idea of being a metaphorical husband in relation to his mother, those first lines, but to be married and use his thing in marriage was too much for him. He felt, till I have no wife, I have nothing, no thing in France. And therefore, took refuge in flight. Our reading of the play would suggest that he takes flight in another direction, into a homosexual fusion with Parolis. It's striking that after the scene where Helena has been given to Bertram, the first time that we see Bertram and Parolis together, Parolis addresses him as sweetheart. Um, not once, but twice in as many lines. Okay. Undone and forfeited to cares forever. What's the matter, sweetheart? Although before the solemn priest I have sworn, I will not bed her. What, what, sweetheart? <laughs> <laughs> but Bertram's conscious object, choice, at the end of the play is for Fontebelle, a common gamester to the camp. On the Elizabethan stage, when played by a boy actor, she might well have looked like a male prostitute in drag. In fact, <laughs> she says her name is Diana, a representation of the chaste goddess Artemis. Now, a ring is a very frequent motive in Shakespeare. In Two Gentlemen of Rona, The Merchant of Venice, Twelfth Night, Cymbeline, for example. At one level of our creative alphabet, it has to do with the potentiality of naught. And the one or more that it may thus impose. Naught represents nothing, a creative empty space, or a place where there's no thing. The ring also represents the circular structure of the play, as Helena at the end plays the physician to the sick Bertram. Parolis, through the play, has been associated, at least in Bertram's mind, with the drum, another circular object which consists of a large quantity of empty air. But as Parolis loses his drum, so Bertram turns his attention to Fontebelle Diana and her ring. He appears, therefore, to be switching his gender preferences and yet still wants to assert his identification with Diana. She says, Mine honour such a ring. She's identifying her honour, which is valuable, with the no penis the no thing which is the ring. Just as she has a ring to give him if and when she chooses, so he has a ring to give her. The ring represents the womb in the secret night substitution, so that in the act of intercourse two becomes one so that they can become three or even sometimes four, if twins are the result. This was Shakespeare's own experience, and it was also the case in the source which Shakespeare used for this play where the Helena character became pregnant with twins. It's understandable, however, that Shakespeare should, in this play, which ends with harmony and reconciliation, wish to change the twins into a single baby, as his own grief and sense of loss, even five or six years after the death of his only son, the twin Hamlet, must have made powerful associations for him. The play represents the coming to terms with grief and loss. Shakespeare's alteration of the source suggests that he was perhaps consciously aware that this process was not yet complete for him. In this play, we begin Act 5 with another minus one, namely Helena's supposed death, so that Diana can say of Bertram at the very end of the play, he knows himself my bed he hath defiled, and at that time he got his wife with child. Dead though she be, she feels her young one kick, so there's my riddle, one that's dead is quick. And now behold the meaning. Which, of course, brings us to the structure of Act Five, so often used by Shakespeare for Act Fives, where the whole group meet together, and in the romances at least, find themselves more than the sum of their parts, an experience which we can recognise when an analytic group is really working at full steam. 
It's striking at the end of the play that so much of what came at the beginning is echoed. The king gives Helena to Bertram again. At the beginning, Bertram deceived the king by giving only a half reply. You be the king. Okay. <laughs> Take her by the hand a and tell her she is thine. I take her by the hand. At the end, however, Bertram, instead of deception, by giving a half reply, gives a double one. Helena says, Will you be mine, now you are doubly one? Bertram, if she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I'll love her dearly, ever, ever dearly. These last lines, which can be so difficult to take for modern audiences, particularly for hard-bitten psychotherapists like ourselves, need to be delivered with conviction and received quite literally, conveying Shakespeare's most powerful allegory of the now largely lost 16th century belief in the neo-Platonic power of redeeming love. In this way, the conversion of Bertram links up with a much earlier conversion, however psychologically and probably it may have been presented of the wicked Proteus in Two Gentlemen of Verona, a wonderful production of which is in the West End at the moment. <laughs> All's well that ends well then, turns out in the end to be a play about the manic defence not being over-punished. At first Parolis did appear to be over-punished for his empty parole words, but at the end of the play, La Feu looks after him and takes him back to Roussillon. Bertram, however, despite the manic flight both from the king in Paris to foreign wars and from the heterosexuality of marriage with Helena to a relationship with Paroles, has both survived the war with bravery and honour and also survived the potentially death-giving heterosexual intercourse. I've already examined in another paper on working with students in higher education, which I can remember I gave in Cambridge seven years ago first, how deeply sexual metaphors with their resonant potential guilts and punishments and with their births and deaths can be such an important cause of academic and examination failure as well as the more obvious sexual losses in reality. This links up to the core of the relationship between metaphor and reality which lies at the foundation of the creative endeavour. In bringing this paper to, to a conclusion, I want just to consider very briefly the issues of unknown loss and double loss, which came up in the discussion a bit, because they have been my companions throughout the writing of this paper, and they have helped to make being creative so difficult. Almost immediately from the somewhat manic alacrity with which I offered to write this paper for the workshop, a double loss is very difficult to mourn. Lady Bracknell's well-known lines, to lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. It points to the, those ex emotions of guilt and shame which may accompany double loss. A double narcissistic blow. A double reason for the mechanism of denial. And the double trajectory, both outwards and inwards, railing in anger against the others, against the world, against God, or against the self in whole or in part. But a double loss may also allow the possibility for double replacement. My second companion, the uncertainty of loss, poses other difficulties along the same spectrum. It rushes back to the past, to the present, and forward to the future in an unremitting, unresolved confusion. Now I'll just from there go straight through, I think. How are we? we, we... Dodgy. Dodgy. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, having these experiences of uh, three losses twice, both but just before the paper and, and since, just wanted to mention a, uh, a personal experience which may mean something to, to, to some of you here, where Janet Bokes and I were working on a paper that we were commissioned in Oxford uh, to give on um, 
uh, the creativity between fathers and daughters in Verdi. And we were working on this, and uh, when we learnt of the death of um, our old colleague here and great friend, Louise Inkin, and when we were working on this, as it became clearer and clearer, it was clearly the background of shared triple loss that was reflected each to each other between Giuseppe Verdi and Giuseppina Strapponi, which seemed to provide such a tremendous fillip to Verdi's creative inspiration. They both, at about the same period in their lives, uh, uh, had this triple loss, and it was their coming together. It took them some time to, to come together, but uh, rather like in the same way that Shakespeare's great masterpieces, uh, that Verdi's great masterpieces also came through this. So I cannot for myself claim a very creative resolution for this time of loss as yet, except perhaps this paper. But I was glad to have been commissioned to write it for all that, and I have a hunch that it is the mirroring potential between collaborators as between lovers and would-be parents, between the artist and his media, which may be most important in determining a successful creative act. Right.